everybody, Jay here with Freedom Media, Sunday Night Report, and tonight I want to talk to you about a few things to do with the climate crisis we're having that is not really a climate crisis at all. The oil and gas that we're dealing with right now, this is not an issue. We know this is not an issue. If anything, we need it. We don't, we can't run this world without oil and gas. Everything that we build, manufacture, drive, Everything is used that we have that's used oil and gas in its existence. And we've seen Greta showed up in Edmonton to start a big schmoz of stuff there and get everybody on board with all this huge crisis that we're having. And I've been saying this for a while, guys. The big crisis that I know that's happening in this world right now that we really should be paying attention to, I've been following it for a long time since it happened in 2011. And this is what we need to be concentrated on because uh, this is huge, guys. This is huge. This is uh, affecting the whole world. It's affecting the ocean. It's affecting the people. It's affecting, affecting the fishing industry. And I think you guys know where I'm going with this. Yes, it's Fukushima. This is the world's real crisis. And I think the reason why we don't hear too much of about it right now is because uh, we know TEPCO... The Tokyo Electric Power Corporation, right from day one, has downplayed this so bad. And we're not getting the full spectrum of what's really going on there. The media, we don't hear nothing from them. We don't hear nothing from the government. We don't hear nothing from the UN. But yet, uh, oil and gas is the big crisis. It's, it's, it's a load, guys. It's a load. Don't believe any of it. It's like they're trying to take uh, everything away from what's really going on in the world, the real disaster that's going on. It's a facade. So I got a few videos I've compiled. I've had a few for a few years already, and I'm going to kind of try and break it down here. I'm going to give you, a, first of all, go back to about 2015 when they first started talking about that they're starting to run out of room to store all this uh, radioactive water and everything else. And then we'll, uh, from there, we'll go back into trying to explain what, how things happened in, in order, and we'll give you a breakdown of everything. Authorities in Japan are set to release water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the sea, despite reports that the water is still highly radioactive after many attempts to decontaminate it. Our Izunze tells us more. Despite reports, treated water at the Fukushima nuclear plant needed to be decontaminated even more before it can be released into the sea. The Japan government has decided to release it anyway. The Japan-based newspaper Mainichi Shimbun reports that Japan's Nuclear Regulation Authority chief told reporters recently that the authority plans to release the water once the radiation levels are lower. However, he added the authority doesn't think more distillation or dilution will help nor does he think it's necessary. Almost 85% of the water is said to contain dangerously high levels of radioactive materials. According to the plant's operator, Tokyo Electric Power Corporation, about 161,000 tons of the treated water is 10 to 100 times over the limit for release into the environment, and another 65,000 tons is up to 20,000 times the limit. The release option faced heavy criticism at town meetings in Fukushima and Tokyo in August, when TEPCO and the Japanese government officials provided little explanation about the contamination. TEPCO says it has the capacity to store up to 1.37 million tons of water through 2020, and it cannot stay at the plant forever. South Korea expressed its concerns over Japan's decision last week. The ocean is not the property of one country but a shared resource of the world. Releasing contaminated water into the sea is likely to have a significant impact on the marine environment and the safety of marine products. Some experts say the water can be stored for decades, but others say the tanks take up too much space and could interfere with ongoing decommissioning work, which the Japanese government hopes to finish before the 2020 Tokyo Summer Olympics. The 2020 Summer Olympics. So where are they going to put all this contaminated water and stuff? So we're going to go into how this all happened, a little bit of explanation about the earthquake, 
Then I'm going to go to a video that we all remember well. It tugs at your heartstrings to watch it. So please be aware of uh, who's watching this with you because it is a little bit uh, sad to watch and a little bit uh, scary. So I'm just going to kind of let these next couple videos play and then I'll chime in kind of as we go. So uh, here's an explanation of from the earthquake into the tsunami and then we're going to go into a breakdown of, by hour and minute of what happened in the actual Fukushima Daiichi power station. In the subduction zone, the overlying plate is locked to the subducting oceanic plate by immense friction along the shallow portion of a vast sloping fault surface. Recent GPS data show that the land above the subduction zone is indeed being pushed backward, deforming in response to the stress. Arrows mark the original locations of the leading edge of the overlying plate and the GPS unit. The plates can lock together until they overcome the frictional stress in a process called elastic rebound. This produces magnitude 8 to magnitude 9 great earthquakes. And if the land is displaced beneath the ocean as it does in this simplified animation, it causes a tsunami. This cycle of locking and building stress followed by catastrophic release repeats every few hundred years. Japan is an area that's no stranger to earthquakes, but this is the strongest quake that they've seen in recorded history. It's an area that's littered with fault zones, got tectonic plates intersecting all over the place. Let me show you where this quake was, uh, just on the northeast coastline of Japan, where the North American plate intersects with the Pacific plate. The Pacific plate actually driving to the west at about 92 millimeters per year. All these orange dots, those are big aftershocks, dozens of them. All right, let's show you graphically what happens when these plates intersect. You get what's called subduction, one plate driving down underneath another, and that creates friction right in here. And eventually, when the friction and the stresses are built up enough, this will pop. And when that ocean floor pops like that, you get a wave that, that happens at the surface. And that wave propagates outward and can travel up, up to 500 miles per hour in the open sea. If you're a boat out there, you barely feel, feel it. We've got buoys that, that sense these things, but as it approaches the coastline, the bottom floor, the bathymetry, will force that water up, slow it down, and drive it inland. And even though these, uh, these uh, waves can only be sometimes five to 10 to 15 feet high, they have a lot of weight, a lot of force behind them. Let's show you a, exactly how much energy was released with this. Here's Japan. Everything that you see in red is where the water, the wave was about four to five feet getting into Japan or into Hawaii and all the way onto the west coast and down across South America. This is a huge historic quake that literally affected an entire hemisphere. <laughs> Yeah. 
Fukushima. The word alone is enough to inspire terror in any seafood aficionado in the wake of the worst nuclear disaster in decades. Going on eight years later, 50,000 households remain evacuated, and bans on fish and vegetables from around the disaster area have been in effect for years to protect the people from lingering radiation. Today, contaminated water from the plant is being stored to prevent it from spreading radiation into the environment and an ingenious refrigeration system keeps the soil around the affected site frozen in an icy boundary meant to keep groundwater away. But how did this modern nuclear disaster start? And how did things get so bad? Let's take a look at the events of March 2011, minute by minute. Monday, March 7, 2011 in a move that will prove to be eerily prophetic, the Tokyo Electric Power Company submits a report to Japan's Nuclear Safety Agency, highlighting the vulnerability of the plant to tsunami forces. The plant's seawall is nearly 6 meters high, and the report highlights an 1897 tsunami with 10.2 meter waves which devastated the location the plant sits at today. Officials take note and make plans to review the strengthening of the seawalls at a future date. Friday, March 11th. 2.46 p.m. A 9.1 magnitude earthquake tears through the seafloor off the coast of Honolulu Island at a depth of 15 miles in the Earth's crust. At the Fukushima nuclear plant, emergency safety systems automatically kick on upon being struck by the first tremor, and reactors 1, 2, and 3 are automatically shut down. Reactors 4, 5, and 6 are currently undergoing maintenance and not operational. 2.47 p.m. The tremor is severe enough to have cut off the power plant from the national electricity grid. On site, backup diesel generators start up. Their job is to continue circulating cooling water into the nuclear reactors, which while shut down, are still incredibly hot and will take a long time to cool. 
Without this cooling water circulating around the reactor core, the core will overheat just like Chernobyl, causing a massive steam explosion. 2.52 PM Reactor 1's emergency cooling system, a safety relief valve, automatically opens in response to rising pressure from inside the reactor vessel. The valve is designed to vent dangerous buildups of steam in order to prevent an explosion. For the next hour, the valve will open and close automatically as it regulates the buildup of pressure inside the reactor. This one safety system is likely responsible for averting a catastrophic explosion. 3.27 PM The first tsunami strikes the 19-foot-high seawall but the wall holds and protects the plant from major flooding. 3.30 PM Steam continues building to dangerous levels inside reactor number one. The safety relief valve prevents an explosion, but the temperature of the steam is steadily climbing as the emergency condenser system meant to cool the steam fails. Workers are extremely concerned, but as long as the safety relief valve remains operational, the reactor vessel should not explode. Many believe that the worst is over and that the first tsunami was the only one they would have to deal with. 3.38 PM One of the backup diesel generators stops running. The rest continue running. But because all but one of the generators are located underground, there is concern of serious flooding from additional tsunami waves. 3.46 PM A 46-foot tsunami crashes into the seawall and overtops it, flooding the entire Fukushima facility. The diesel generators are all flooded and shut down, and their fuel tanks are washed away by roaring waves. Now all power has been lost in the facility, and all but the mechanical safety systems meant to operate without power are offline. Temperatures begin to rise inside the reactors, and only the remaining safety systems are keeping any check on the temperature rise, though they alone will not be enough to prevent a major disaster. 4 PM the Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency of Japan begins post-disaster emergency procedures and convenes an emergency headquarters. Personnel contact all nuclear power plants in Japan in an attempt to ascertain their condition. The news from Fukushima is grim, but so far the exterior plant sensors have not detected any release of radioactivity into the surrounding environment. 6 PM Inside Reactor 1, water levels have fallen so low that the top of the nuclear fuel rods are now exposed to dry air inside the reactor vessel. Without water to radiate their heat onto, the temperature inside the reactor immediately begins climbing again. 6.18 PM Workers restore power to Reactor 1's emergency cooling system, and water once more begins circulating. Workers, however, are unaware of the massive boil-off of water inside the reactor. 7.02 PM Prime Minister Naoto Khan declares a nuclear emergency. The declaration is followed by announcements that no radiation leaks have been detected and it's merely a cautionary measure. 7.30 PM Fuel rods inside Reactor 1 are now fully exposed to air as water levels continue to drop. The incredible buildup of heat causes the rods to begin melting and pooling at the bottom of the reactor vessel as a molten slag heap of highly radioactive metal. 9 PM Workers fear that the dropping water levels inside Reactor 1 are inevitably going to lead to a Chernobyl-like steam explosion. The government issues an emergency evacuation order to all residents within 2 miles of the plant. Residents within 6.2 miles are told they can remain in their homes, but they should be prepared to evacuate nonetheless. Inside Reactor number 1, the pressure is at twice normal levels and climbing. Older power plant workers offer to take the place of the younger men on duty at the plant. Knowing that disaster may be inevitable and preferring to place themselves at risk to radiation poisoning over the younger workers. Saturday, March 12th, 2.44 AM Emergency battery power for the high-pressure core flutter system, the main emergency cooling method for reactor number 3, runs out. Water begins boiling off inside the reactor vessel. 4.15 AM Inside reactor 3, the dropping water levels expose the fuel rods and temperature immediately skyrockets. 5.30 AM The situation inside Reactor 1 is critical. Extremely high pressure threatens to explode the containment vessel at any moment. Officials have been arguing all night over a proposed and extremely risky maneuver which could cause a large explosion. And yet, if not attempted, the vessel is guaranteed to explode. At last, it's agreed to vent steam from directly inside the reactor, and the workers hold their breath as large volumes of steam is allowed to vent into the air above the plant. Not only is the steam slightly radioactive, but there is a large possibility of hydrogen having been formed inside the containment vessel due to the high pressure and temperatures, and it's feared that that could ignite after combining with oxygen. The venting is successful, and there's no explosion. 5.50 AM more emergency power is restored, allowing plant workers to pump fresh water into Reactor 1 in an attempt to cool the fuel rods. 6.50 AM 
Although workers do not realize that the entire core of reactor number one has completely melted and fallen to the bottom of the pressure vessel. With temperatures reaching over 2,190 degrees, the zirconium in the fuel rod splits the hydrogen from the water vapor and the steam inside the vessels. This causes a buildup of dangerous hydrogen gas. 10.58 AM Pressure inside reactor number two reaches critical levels, and once more workers gamble by venting off some of the radioactive steam to avoid an explosion. 3.30 PM Residents within six miles are now being evacuated. All fear a Chernobyl-style explosion at the power plant. 3.36 PM Hydrogen gas buildup inside the containment vessel of reactor number one reaches critical levels and there's a massive explosion, cracking open the containment vessel but leaving the reactor core intact. Four workers are injured and the concrete building that surrounds the reactor vessel collapses. 7 PM Workers begin pumping seawater directly into reactor number one in an attempt to keep the core cool. 7.25 PM In a bid to limit how much water becomes contaminated, Tokyo Electric Power Company orders that the seawater injection be halted. Plant boss Masao Yoshida orders his workers to continue pumping in seawater though. Ignoring TEPCO, he fears a meltdown more than the release of contaminated water. 9.40 PM The evacuation zone is extended to 12.4 miles. Sunday, March 13th. 2.42 AM, the high-pressure coolant injection system inside reactor number three fails, and water levels immediately begin falling as the water is boiled off by the intense heat of the fuel rods. 5.10 AM, Fukushima Unit 1 is declared an International Nuclear and Radiological Event Scale Level 4 event, signifying an accident with local consequences. 7 AM, water levels inside reactor number three have dropped so low that the top of the fuel rods are now exposed. 9 AM, Reactor number three's fuel rods begin to melt, causing a buildup in hydrogen gas. 1 PM, workers believe that reactor number three has suffered a partial meltdown, and reactors one and three are once more vented in order to relieve the growing pressure. The reactor containment vessels are refilled with water and boric acid, which absorbs neutrons and helps prevent more nuclear reactions from the fuel inside the reactors. Reactor number two has low water levels and high pressure, but is believed to be stable. Monday, March 14th. 11.01 AM, hydrogen gas buildup inside the containment vessel at reactor number three leads to an explosion, collapsing the building housing and container and injuring six workers. TEPCO announces no release of radioactive material, but the blast damages the water supply helping keep Unit 2 cool. 1.15 PM, reactor number two's cooling systems fail and water levels immediately begin falling. 3 PM, a large chunk of molten fuel inside reactor number three drops to the bottom of the pressure vessel and pools there. 6 PM, water levels inside reactor number two now reach the top of the fuel rods and the temperature climbs as the exposed rods overheat. 8 PM, reactor number two now also enters a meltdown state as its fuel rods begin to melt from the extreme heat. Hydrogen gas once more builds up as the zirconium strips hydrogen away from the water vapor. Tuesday, March 15th, 11 AM. A second explosion due to hydrogen gas buildup rocks reactor number three, which damages the cooling systems of reactor number two. 8 PM, reactor number two is now in worse condition than the other two reactors and is in a full blown meltdown as most of the nuclear fuel drops to the bottom of the reactor pressure vessel. An explosion causes damage to unit two's containment system and radiation levels rise significantly but quickly fall once more. Workers would go on to bravely battle the rising temperatures inside the stricken reactors and fuel rod storage pools. Ultimately, the Fukushima disaster would lead to a permanent quarantine zone around the stricken power plant, which lasts to this day, and to massive protests across the country over nuclear power. Yet the plant used reactors that were over 40 years old and lacked many of the safety features of modern reactors. Additionally, in the years since the disaster, workers have come forward to state that much of the plant suffered from poor maintenance and that many of the safety cooling systems had not been tested since the reactors were first installed 40 years ago. Do you love strange, unexpected stories that defy belief but are completely true? Then you'll love the new show I Am. Be one of the first to subscribe now and tell us who you want to see brought to life in I Am. So there you go guys, there's some pretty scary stuff that happened throughout that that we don't really know exactly what on. We got told by the news once again, the fake news, the fake media, the fake uh, TEPCO Power Corporation that downplayed everything so bad that we don't even know.
So the whole scary part about the whole situation here is what's the aftermath of it now. And we're going to go into that now. And I'll show you what's really going on there. Japan has a lot of contaminated water on its hands and seemingly nowhere to put it all. All of that water has accumulated since an earthquake and tsunami hit the Fukushima plant back in 2011. And not only is the buildup dangerous, but Japan's potential plan to throw it in the water now has a lot of people on edge, as you can imagine. CTV's Angie Seth has this story for us today. She joins me now. Okay, Angie, tell us more about this bad water and what they're planning to do with it all. Yeah, and it's, as you say, uh, Jen, it certainly is raising uh, a number of confirms, uh, concerns. Rather, So we're talking about Tokyo Electric or TEPCO. They're awaiting advice from an expert panel on exactly what to do with around 1 million tons of contaminated water that's been storing for the past eight years. Now, this water is be was being used to keep the fuel cores at the Fukushima nuclear plant cool. Well, the plant suffered extensive damage back in 2011 from the earthquake and tsunami putting the fuel, fuel cores at risk of overheating. Well, the concern right now is, is TEPCO is running out of time and running out of room, rather, to restore this water, which contains contaminants, including tritidium. Now, tritidium is a radioactive form of hydrogen. It's a common byproduct of nuclear reactors. Exposure in large quantities can be dangerous. However, the argument is the level of this is rather harmless. It's at much lower levels. The expert panel is going to be looking at five different options, one being ground injection, C discharge after diluting the tritidium concentration, discharging the water as steam or discharging it as hydrogen, solidifying it and then burying it in the ground. So Japan's environment minister is saying, in his opinion, Jen, the best option is to dilute this water and then drain it back into the Pacific Ocean. Yes, but that's raising a whole lot of alarm bells, Angie, and might even affect Canada. Well, exactly. And I mean, just putting anything that's been contaminated back into our water systems or even into the ground is certainly a big concern. One side of the argument is it's common practice for coastal nuclear plants to dispose of this water, but that water will eventually make its way to Canada. This is the scary part. We're going to go into what's going on here with the ocean. And we're going to go on to what it's done to the ecosystem. It tends to become more and more concentrated as we move up the uh, food chain. It will show up even on the west coast of Canada or the west coast of the United States, albeit at very low concentrations. So low concentrations, he's saying there, but on the flip side, there are concerns of the impact this is going to have on fisheries who are still recovering from the nuclear crisis back in 2011 from that earthquake and tsunami. South Korea also warning Japan, quote, to take a wise and prudent decision on the issue. Meantime, TEPCO is also coming under fire from fishermen after admitting last year the water in its tanks contained other contaminants besides tritidium. Now, so as it stands, the expert panel will assess the situation, but as we mentioned, the clock is ticking. TEPCO says it'll run out of room just to, to store this water by 2022. Jen, couple that with pressure from our env environmental groups mm -hmm. who are saying that the only option is for Japan to commit to an environmentally friendly option here. Okay, we'll keep an eye on this. Thanks, Angie. Yeah. Fukushima nuclear disaster has contaminated the world's largest ocean in only five years and it's still leaking 300 tons of radioactive waste every day. In 2011, an earthquake created a tsunami that caused a meltdown at the TEPCO nuclear power plant in Fukushima, Japan. Three nuclear reactors melted down and released radiation. Over the next three months, radioactive chemicals leaked into the Pacific Ocean. However, the numbers may actually be much higher as Japanese official estimates have been proven by several scientists to be flawed in recent years. Fukushima continues to leak an astounding 300 tons of radioactive waste into the Pacific Ocean every day. It will continue to do so indefinitely as the source of the leak cannot be sealed as it is inaccessible to both humans and robots due to extremely high temperatures. It should come as no surprise that Fukushima has contaminated the entire Pacific Ocean in just five years. This could easily be the worst environmental disaster in human history and it is almost never talked about by politicians, 
establishment scientists, or the news. Even if we can't see the radiation itself, some parts of North America's western coast have been feeling the effects for years. Not long after Fukushima, fish in Canada began bleeding from their gills, mouths, and eyeballs. This disease has been ignored by the government and has decimated native fish populations, including the North Pacific herring. In Western Canada, independent scientists have measured a 300% increase in the level of radiation. According to them, the amount of radiation in the Pacific Ocean is increasing every year. Further south in Oregon, starfish began losing legs and then disintegrating entirely when Fukushima radiation arrived there in 2013. Now, they are dying in record amounts, putting the entire oceanic ecosystem in that area at risk. However, government officials say Fukushima is not to blame even though radiation in Oregon tuna tripled after Fukushima. In 2014, radiation on California beaches increased by 500 percent. In response, government officials said that the radiation was coming from a mysterious unknown source and was nothing to worry about. However, Fukushima is having a bigger impact than just the west coast of North America. Scientists are now saying that the Pacific Ocean is already radioactive and is currently at least 5 to 10 times more radioactive than when the U.S. government dropped numerous nuclear bombs in the Pacific during and after World War II. If we don't start talking about Fukushima soon, we could all be in for a very unpleasant surprise. So here's the thing, guys. They push this climate crisis crap on us and tell us it's fossil fuels and oil and gas and all the mining and everything we're doing in Canada mainly. Seems like anywhere else they can do what they want. And this is the narrative that they've been pushing on us with the UN, everything else. But you also uh, can see here why there's cause for concern here. This has been one of the biggest points I've been trying to make for the last seven, eight years now. That uh, this has to be, this can't be overlooked anymore. We have to do something about it. And if the UN really wants to be the, the rulers of the planet, maybe they should uh, jump in and put some money towards cleaning this up. Because something's got to be done. I don't know what it is myself. I'm not an expert. I'm just here trying to educate everybody on the things that are going on. But uh, I found out what got me going on this that I knew I had to do a report is about uh, a couple weeks ago here. It was actually October 12th when the typhoon hit. They had a little bit of an incident. Did you guys hear this on the news? Probably not. And uh, I'm going to show you this. This is from Japan itself. And then after this, because they don't show you anything about the actual stuff that happened, I'm going to show you a picture that's going to blow you away. The most powerful typhoon to hit Japan in decades has left more than 30 people dead and 19 missing. As Typhoon Hagibe has moved in a northerly direction before exiting the island nation late Sunday, it left a trail of destruction, including the nuclear-stricken prefecture of Fukushima. What's alarming? Bags containing waste materials generated during a decontamination work in the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant found in the nearby river. Our Emin Sun has a top story this morning. The season's 19th typhoon, Hagibis, slammed into Japan over the weekend, causing dozens of casualties and leaving many regions flooded. Hagibis also swept across Fukushima, home to the nuclear plant that melted down following the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. According to Japanese media, the city of Tamura in Fukushima Prefecture said Sunday that an unknown number of bags containing contaminated waste from the plant were lost. Officials say heavy rains carried the bags to the nearby Furumichi River. That river connects to another river and flows into the Pacific Ocean. The city retrieved 10 bags from the river, but they haven't been able to confirm how many went missing out of the more than 2,600 bags kept in a temporary storage. Each bag weighs between 700 kilograms and 1.3 tons. They contain grass and wood collected from areas that were heavily contaminated by radiation. City officials insist contaminated waste did not leak out of the bags and they will carefully check the storage and management record. 
However, this isn't the first time something like this has happened. In 2015, contaminated waste from the Fukushima plant went missing in similar circumstances when the region was hit by torrential downpours. Lee min Sun, Arirang News. How do you not know how many bags of contaminated waste are lost? How do you not have a handle on something as critical as nuclear waste? How do you not know where this is? How do you not, how are you not be able to account for it? Why is this not uh, contained in a lockdown facility and everything else? I mean, we have PCBs around Canada that are locked down. They're buried, they're fenced in, there's cameras, so nobody can get in or out. And surely to hell, in an area where there's uh, ocean and rivers and stuff, you should uh, maybe build something up so you can get this stuff on higher ground where it can't be affected. Now I'm going to show you a picture. I dug and dug and dug and I actually got to Japan's, some of their newspaper clippings and I clipped this picture out and when I seen it I was absolutely blown away. This is their containment facility along the river. Are you kidding me? What do we got here? A fence post and a wire? Like, where's your chain link fence? Like, where are you guys, you know, back up on the top right-hand corner, you can see it's higher ground. Why are you guys putting this stuff on the bottom where the rivers that got access to, to wash it away? Like, they're not taking this seriously at all. And how the UN or anybody else or... The, any governments aren't holding these guys accountable for what's going on over there is a disgrace to the globe. And you're going to tell me that there's a climate crisis and Canada is to blame because of our oil and gas? Are you freaking serious? This makes me so irate, guys, that I just I have to bring this out and make everybody see what's really going on here because it's a complete disgrace. They're hypocrites. You're going to go after Canada with our oil and gas where we have some of the best environmental policies and technology to try and clean everything up in the world, and you're going to attack Canada. Are you freaking serious? Anyways, guys, I just wanted to bring this out to you, show a little bit. I'm going to do some more reporting on Fukushima in the future. We're going to dig deeper, and I just wanted to get this out. So you guys can see what's going on. I'm going to try and keep these to 30-minute sessions so you guys can handle all the information. I know it's an overload, but I'm trying to put it together so you guys can see what's really going on because a lot of this stuff needs to be shared out there. It's unbelievable what's going on behind the scenes, and I'm, I'm really disappointed in the government and the media for not actually saying anything about this. But again, you know why they're not reporting it? Because they don't want to cause mass panic because they don't know what to do. It's another time they have no idea what to do. So thanks for watching, guys. Uh, thanks for checking out Freedom Media. I'm going to keep on doing more of these reports. I'm going to find out, uh, find new things to talk about and report on or what's going on around the world. So share this out. Make sure everybody knows what's going on. We need to expose the corruption in this globe. And we're going to start doing this more and more. So thanks, guys, for coming out. And we will talk to you all later.